Hi everyone, I'm Alistair Byrne and you're watching Expressive Photography. In this video, I want to do a bit of a primer on night photography. Um, Anne Christine and I are just back from the island of Tenerife where we were running a short workshop and we were up in the Mount Taide uh, National Park area photographing the Milky Way over all of this crazy lava fields um, and it really rekindled my passion for night photography. Funnily enough, the photograph that's on the screen right now was taken on my very first day of landscape photography back in the autumn of 2003, taken in Banff National Park. And I had been out uh, in the afternoon taking photographs around Vermilion Lake with about 50 other photographers. And uh, later that night, realized that the moon was full and bathing the whole area in this gorgeous, gorgeous soft light. So it went down to the lake again and found myself alone uh, with no other photographers in an incredibly beautiful place, but in the dark. Uh, and that began my personal love affair with night photography that pretty much carried all the way through until I published my first ebook on night photography back in 2012, Seeing the Unseen. So in this video, I want to kind of talk about the things that I had forgotten <laughs> when I went out recently uh, and realized just how difficult it can be to make good photographs at night. Um, so let's look at some of the important things and hopefully this will help you to go out and make sure that you have the best possible time trying to make photographs in the dark. One of the things I always struggled with back then was the lack of learning material and all there really was was rules of thumb. You know, if there was a half a moon in the sky, you could expose for this amount of time at this ISO. And likewise, if there was no moon, you could do longer because there was just less light around. And one of the things I did whilst I was evaluating it to write basically one of the first books on night photography was how to assess the available light. Composition is a massively important thing and one of the big problems we have in the dark is not being able to see. So assessing the available light right off the bat seems to be the best thing to do. And the easiest way to do that is to grab your lens, open it up to its widest aperture and if that's 2.8 or 1.8 or 1.4 then all the better because more light can get in. Rank up the ISOs to 3200 open the shutter for 30 seconds and see what you get. At this point in time, focus isn't that important. What we're trying to do is assess the available light. Once you have your exposure, you, you can then determine how long you can expose for to get specific results, whether you want star trails or sharp stars. So this long exposure test shot is really the kind of foundation stone of everything that will come after that. Knowing what you want to have in the scene, understanding whether it's going to be a long exposure to get circular star trails or a short exposure to get short star trails. In this first exposure that you can see here, this was uh, me knowing nothing about night photography at all, literally day one, pointing my camera at the scene. And I actually shot, um, I believe this is 30 seconds at f6.3 at ISO 100. So that's how little I knew about night photography. The This is the worked version. The original file is somewhat darker. So this is not a great example of how to expose properly at night. But also at 17 mil here, we can see that there's a tiny amount of motion in the stars, even at 17 mil. One of the, I'm not a great fan of rules, but one of the good rules to know is the 500 rule. And if you divide 500 by the focal length of your lens, including any crop factor, so if you're on a full frame sensor at 35 millimeters, then that is the focal length into 500. 
So on a 24 millimeter lens, 500 divided by 24 is about 20 to 21 seconds. This is one of the mistakes I made on Mount Taide uh, a couple of weeks ago, is I was shooting 30 seconds at 24 mil, and there's a tiny amount of movement in the stars. So I get basically a, a D minus for that assignment um, and need to go back to school, basically for summer camp, which is what I'm about to start now. There's no two ways about it that night photography is one of those things that give you this incredible opportunity to take photographs under very incongruous light. We're so used to sunrises and sunsets or even shooting during the day where the light is strong and powerful. At night, everything is softer, everything is more subdued. And we have an opportunity to create not just photographs that feel very different from how they would be taken during the day. The whole color palette is different but also to have incredible experiences uh, when we were on Mount Taide uh, and was just up there without a camera and was just enjoying lying on the ground, looking up at the stars, looking at the Milky Way, looking at shooting stars flying over or even satellites passing overhead. And then as you start getting towards sunrise, the dawn appears and it's a very gentle and soft time of day as well. Everything starts to reveal. And I think from an expressive point of view or expressive photography point of view, being there to have an incredible experience, I think, is a really fundamentally important thing. I studied astronomy and astrophysics at university. That's what I that's what I did when I was uh, when I left school. And I was I've always had a fascination with the night. So it's really important to be out there for the right reasons. Composition is king. I think I said that to you before. The most important thing with night photography is to, is to make a frame that feels and looks interesting. It has to be composed in the same way that a day photograph or a normal photograph would be made. Just pointing your camera at the stars and throwing in whatever happens to be there you know, it, it's a bit of a sloppy way to go about things. So I think we really should be focusing on trying to arrange the frame. And then if the Milky Way is going to be in there, understanding where in the frame that is going to be. I've had so much fun out at night over the years. This is a photograph from back in 2012. Um, everything is different. Everything is better. Experiencing the world by night and making photographs of it is such a cool thing to do. In terms of some of the practicalities, one of the greatest difficulties at night is the fact that it's dark and not really knowing uh, anything about your camera. Most people tend to use some kind of head torch and it's become very popular these days to use red light head torches purely because they don't dilate your pupils in the same way that white light head torches do. So yes, I would recommend you use a red light head torch. However, when people are shooting, don't point it all over the foreground. Um, I was recently, or a few years ago, was on Iceland and shooting Aurora, and the entire foreground was red just by various people flashing their head torches around. It's a very frustrating thing. So uh, if you're out there with your buddies, make sure you're not uh, flashing red lights when they're trying to photograph, and kindly ask them not to do the same for you. Uh, Having said that, some of the results can be quite curious. This is one from the Gobi Desert back in about 2018. And this one is from Mount Taide uh, a couple of weeks ago when my buddy was uh, accidentally shining red light into my foreground. Now, they're kind of cool, actually. So this is where expressive photography is different from the rules of photography. Sometimes unexpected results can be quite pleasing. And in this particular case, I think it creates quite an incongruous uh, side effect. So be careful, but also appreciate that you can be out there and have fun and not screaming at each other is a really good way to go. So let's start looking at a recap of everything. Night photography is should be um, applied to the same standards as daytime photography in that the composition and the way the frame is organized should be somewhat interesting. Um, we spent quite a bit of time scouting uh, the area that we were going to photograph. Uh, we went up there twice during the day and had two sessions up there at night also. And what it meant was we knew exactly where we were and we knew exactly where we wanted to get to. 
Today with modern technology, it's very easy to put a pin on a, on a satellite image to know exactly where you want to get to, to focus on a specific rock formation perhaps, or a patch of flowers or a rock arch or whatever it may be. And secondly, it's a very good idea to have a pin for where you've parked your truck. Uh, I've heard of numerous horror stories of people going out at night they trek out in the evening, uh, out into the desert or whatever. They photograph for hours and hours under the beautiful uh, night sky and then they've got no idea how to get back. And these situations are obviously extremely dangerous. Make sure you have adequate provisions with you, food, water, snacks, a map, a GPS or a compass or preferably all of those, um, satellite, emergency trackers, any way of getting hold of the FBI to make sure they can come and rescue you if something horrible happens. So scouting out the area beforehand is by far the best way to go, having an idea of the lie of the land. This area I was photographing up on Mount Tidy a few weeks ago is really just very desolate, very Martian almost. We had no moon when we were there at all, so no moon in the sky, so it was very, very dark with the tiniest amount of little light pollution on the horizon from, from uh, habitation down below us. So I decided that I wasn't going to bother trying to get exposures for the land. I just went for quite striking silhouettes um, and quite liked just that stark, minimalistic type of feel. Of course, you can make much more complicated shots at night uh, by using foreground interest, whether it's flowers or uh, rocks or interesting things in foregrounds and making multiple exposures to get exposures for the land and the sky. This, of course, is an extremely technical thing to do. Both of the shots I've showed you from Mount Tidy are panoramics and that was just as simple as taking multiple exposures and letting Lightroom blend those. So we can push the envelope a little bit and make more complicated photos should we wish. But being safe and secure, scouting out the locations in advance to know where you're going, assessing the available light with some form of long exposure test shot uh, or high ISO test shot to allow you to understand how much light is available, what is the reflective nature of the subjects that you're pointing at. This is black lava rocks, <laughs> they were never going to be particularly luminous. Um, and then where the depth of field is going to be. All of these photographs were shot at f2.8. Those rocks are probably about 10 to 15 feet away from me. So as long as I was focused on the rocks, then the stars were going to be somewhat sharp as well, purely because of the amount of depth of field I have at f2.8 with a 24 millimeter lens on a Nikon D850. There's all sorts of apps available today to allow you to calculate those things from photo pills. Uh, and of course, the photographer's ephemeris tells you where the stars are going to be and where the moon's going to be rising. All of that technology is great for planning. Night photography is definitely one of those situations where you want to know where the Milky Way is going to be. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, we knew that at about 4.30, 5 o'clock in the morning, the Milky Way would be up and would be aligned beautifully with the, the rocks that we'd found earlier that day. The final point to mention is focus. Uh, like I said, the depth of field is a very important thing to do. Don't assume that you can just turn your camera to infinity focus and it will be at infinity. Very few cameras have what is known as a hard stop infinity focus. Most of them you have to dial it slightly back. You can check that uh, during the day just by focusing on something far away and you can mark your lens with a little bit of tape or something. That's the old school way that we used to do back in the day. Uh, now I just prefer to walk over there with my head torch put it in the rocks and focus on that from where I'm going to take the shot and then go and retrieve the head torch. And then I know that I'm focused exactly where I want to be. So hopefully you found this little primer useful. Like I said, night photography was something I got so passionate about during the 2000s. And I spent from 2009 to 2011 researching and planning and working out how to do all these things at night because there wasn't really any learning material available these days. Uh, the ebook uh, Seeing the Unseen is still available and people do still buy it. And I think most of the content that's in it is still completely relevant to the contemporary scene. 
things have moved on somewhat. Cameras are better. Things like um, Topaz uh, Denoise AI is an incredible tool for getting rid of noise in photographs. Lightroom Classic now has an incredible noise reduction AI tool built into it as well. There's never been a better time to go out at night to make photographs. The technology now is just so much better than it was 20 years ago when I started doing it. As I said, I hope you've enjoyed this little primer and some of the photographs that I've taken over the years and including some of the stuff I've been doing recently up on Mount Tidy. Uh, I'll upgrade my D- to a C+, uh, because I still kind of like this. Uh, there are a few little flaws, but um, yeah, I'm not telling. Uh, if you enjoy this content, please subscribe, check out other videos that we have made over the years, and hopefully you'll find something there that you enjoy. Thank you very much for watching. I'll talk again soon. Bye for now. <laughs>